Uh, I was uh, still flying my glider, effectively as a disabled pilot, uh, but I was still actively reading the flying press. And I read in, in a magazine that an organisation then called the British Disabled Flying Club uh, had been donated some old aircraft. Uh, and I thought, uh, oh, well, that sounds interesting. I read a bit further. But it said that they were looking for volunteers to help join a project to effectively refurbish and get got these aircraft flying so so I started off as a volunteer I was going to say working full time in a pharmaceutical company running clinical trials still gliding still flying light airplanes but aware that I was going to need some more help to do that moving forwards I do have a progressive condition it does get a little bit worse every day so I thought I, I would, be, would be better off getting more involved in the disabled flying scene helping to develop the disabled flying community being part of it and doing more to develop tech and ways to do things. So yeah, the rest is history. Got involved in 2004 and 2005, getting the first airplane flying a bulldog that had been donated to the charity by the Jordanian Royal Air Force. So uh, yeah, it was great to be part of something I knew that was going to become, I somehow knew it was going to become a bigger part of my life. I guess I realised if I was going to carry on flying, I ought to be around other disabled people with similar challenges so I could be part of it and learn from there as well. So life gives you those shocks, those moments to actually help you recalibrate the way you think about doing things but yeah that journey to using a chair is really tough I, I really can't empathize with anybody that has to make the move to a wheelchair but ultimately it's a really positive thing to do I remember I became pretty much reclusive not leaving the house because you're frightened of falling over or or things happening and even little things you start to miss like going to Tesco's to do the family shop once a week, things like that. Once you can't do them, you start to realise that you're starting to miss out on the basics. And I remember when I did eventually start to use a power chair, an electric wheelchair that I bought second hand, it was an absolute revelation to go back to Tesco and buy a pint of milk, something I hadn't done for two years. And I realised actually the chair doesn't inhibit what you could do. It actually enables you to get back to some normality, which is what we all need as human beings. So, yeah, moments like that, you realise, yeah, I've got to stick with this. I've got to persevere. But actually, a wheelchair is an enabler, not something that takes away your capability. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you get used to it. So you're regaining control of the situation and you, you can't control the adversity that you're facing, but you can somehow adapt your environment to suit you by getting into a wheelchair and going, okay, well, now I'm empowered again and I can use this wheelchair to go to Tesco's. Yeah, it's a physical thing, isn't it? And it sounds small, but actually those little things in life is what makes life. And if your disability stops you doing those, those little things, getting that back is really key for our well-being. Just to be like everybody else, we are gregarious things. We like to do the same things. We like to mix with other people. And disability often takes that choice away from you. One thing about disability is that there is no choice. It's, it's happening to you. Uh, a lot of people struggle with understanding that it is happening to them. And rather than getting it, letting it overwhelm them, I'm sure it will for all of us at times, but actually to actually use technology like a wheelchair or a walker or whatever you need to help you do what you need to do, is absolutely worth trying to use because ultimately it gives you back your freedom and choice. So talk to me a little bit more then about adapting the environment around you so that you can still do everything you want to do, such as, you know, driving, for example, and, or flying. Yeah, so uh, I think each disability has key bits of kit or, or ways of doing things to make things possible for, for me to carry on flying, certainly my glider, and light airplanes, it's the hoist. So the hoist that can actually lift me out of the wheelchair and put me into the pilot seat, literally, 
that's been a key bit of kit for me to carry on being involved in light aviation and gliding. So wherever possible, I try and use technology to effectively balance out the, uh, the disability. So my vehicle, the, the car that I drive, there's a hydraulic lift on the side, which lifts the chair into the car. I actually drive the car from the wheelchair. Uh, and uh, a special joystick electronic steering system. Literally, I can drive the whole car with my fingertips. But that's actually the same technology that was developed for the, the lunar buggy back in the late uh, early 70s, the Apollo space missions. The, the steering system that was developed for that is the same system in my car, which I think is really cool. So I've got a bit of space tech. But genuinely, that's, that's similar technology. So, yeah, so I have a vehicle that I drive independently. It allows me to keep a little bit of uh, choice about where I go, for example. So, Mike, that's an incredible story of resilience and overcoming adversity. So what advice can you share with our viewers and listeners? Perhaps someone who is facing a huge life change, whether it's bereavement, divorce, or going through a transition from being able-bodied using a wheelchair, what sources of support can they rely on? And what do you think they can learn from your story? I think everyone is different, but there are certain things that I always say to people that ultimately resilience isn't something that happens overnight. If there's no magic bullet to whatever challenge you've got. Let's face it, life is ups and downs and some days are gonna to be tough. Some weeks, some months, some years are gonna to be tough. Whatever the challenge, but ultimately, We've only got one life. We've got to live it and really make the best of what we got. I think whether you're somebody with a physical challenge or a learning disability or a mental health issue, whatever there are, challenges, you know, things that happen, as you mentioned, for example, losing a loved one, divorce, losing a job. These are all challenges that life gives you, but it gives everybody at some stage. So I think communication is key. I think talking to our friends, our family, not bottling things up. I think I've been guilty of that, of just sort of not, not talking about things. So I'd always encourage everybody just to, just to talk about it. You know, the, the conversations like we're having today, Harriet, they're important because, you know, there's nothing special about me. I'm just a guy that likes airplanes and likes to, to help other people fly. And, but ultimately, you know, we all are motivated by similar things. But it's just to do a bit of good to to enjoy life and to enjoy getting out of bed in the morning. And I think those are the things that we can learn how to do the best by just keeping that positivity, talking to people, learning from each other. So for somebody who's facing an overwhelming situation, our strapline at Inspirability is you have control. How do you think, or what advice would you give to someone to how they can somehow just regain control of that situation and perhaps with how they deal with it and how they can process it to move forwards? I think the first message is it's okay to be fed up. It's okay to be cheesed off about it. It's okay to think, why me? Those are normal human reactions. But I think what's important to remember is that there are millions of other people around the world going you through challenges of their own. And I think really, you know, you've got to have glass half full. I think I really despair of seeing disabled people and people with challenges that feel like they're broken or the world has beaten them. And I think the one thing that I'm so proud of what Airability does is to open the door, give people the chance to fly, see the world from a new perspective, see other disabled people that are working, driving, flying, in relationships, or, or failing at things. You know, it's okay to fail. Uh, and I think once disabled people often see that, that puts them on a new path. You know, if I can fly, what else can I do? These are some of the mantras that we live by, our ability. So it's about putting life in front of people, but also opportunity in front of people which ultimately gives choice and satisfaction. And how do you manage to stay motivated every day? What tips can you give us? Well, I think I enjoy doing something that 
Well, it's a, it's a real privilege. I know that sounds corny, but to give people the chance to fly, something that means so much to me and has been such a positive influence on my life, why wouldn't I want to help others do that? And although I don't get the chance or the ability to fly as much as I used to, and believe me, I really do miss it. I would happily be out there every day turning the world upside down. You know, I really miss doing the things I used to do, doing competition gliding and aerobatics and formation flying. That stuff was all something that I really enjoyed doing. It was, was quite good at. But giving others to do that, the chance to do that, is a pretty good second best. So, yeah, it still hurts some days when I look out the window and see a formation of airplanes go past, thinking oh, I should be doing that. But to be around it still and be part of it still, that's what, what really sort of motivates me. And it's simple, putting a smile on the face of somebody else. That's a good thing to be able to do in life. So how did you discover aerobility then and turn something so life-changing around to something that has become so positive and helped so many people? Like some of the best things in life, it was purely an accident. Uh, I was uh, still flying my glider, effectively as a disabled pilot, uh, but I was still actively reading the flying press. And I read in, in a magazine that an organisation then called the British Disabled Flying Club uh, had been donated some old aircraft. Uh, and I thought, uh, oh, well, that sounds interesting. I read a bit further. And it said that they were looking for volunteers to help join a project to effectively refurbish and get get these aircraft flying. So I uh, emailed and um, or made a call. I was invited to uh, a committee meeting of, uh, of this organisation. And uh, the rest is history. I sort of found myself putting my hand up during this meeting to say, yeah, I might know some people and then we could pull together a team to get uh, one of these airplanes flying. And that turned into uh, the first airplane for the charity, the Bulldog, which we rebuilt back in 2004 or 2005. And that's how my journey started. Uh, and uh, I haven't really looked back. And tell me about your journey since then. So I started off as a volunteer, as I say, working full time in a pharmaceutical company running clinical trials, still gliding, still flying light airplanes but aware that I was going to need some more help to do that moving forwards. I do have a progressive condition. It does get a little bit worse every day. So I thought I, I would be better off getting more involved in the disabled flying scene, helping to develop the disabled flying community, being part of it and doing more to develop tech and ways to do things. Um, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. Got involved in 2004, 2005 getting the first airplane flying a bulldog that had been donated to the charity by the Jordanian Royal Air Force. So, uh, yeah, it was great to be part of something I knew that was going to become, I somehow knew it was going to become a bigger part of my life. I guess I realised if I was going to carry on flying, I ought to be around other disabled people with similar challenges so I could be part of it and learn from them as well. So how did you find drawing on those sources of support around you with um, dealing with the situation that you were facing? Uh, I think it's always good to be around other like-minded people, whatever you're doing in life. If you share some common interest or challenge with somebody, you're inevitably bonded together by that shared interest or challenge. So being around other people with an interest in aviation and challenged by disability is kind of a double uh, positive, really. So yeah, brought us all together more and more. So tell me about some of the projects then that you've been involved with, with AeroAbility, some of your highlights. Yeah, I guess one of the things that I'm known for is stupid ideas. So I do have a bit of a crazy imagination at times. So we've had a number of weird and wacky projects. I think one of the ones I'm most proud of is the, the Paralympic opening ceremony fly past. So back in 2012, we arranged the world's first nighttime air display over a capital city with fireworks on the wings. So it was a real challenge to get that approved by the authorities. But we did it. So we had one of our flyers, a wounded soldier, was flying the aeroplane. And what a great moment to be on TVs around the world uh, doing something so visual, so impressive, and actually showing that 
it's absolutely possible these days for disabled people to do things like fly an airplane or open a Paralympic Games, you know. Um, so that's one of the things we've done. Other weird and wacky ideas we've had are setting Guinness World Records. So we, uh, as a charity, we hold the record for towing the world's heaviest aircraft from wheelchairs, 130 tons, 98 wheelchairs, pulling a uh, Boeing 787 Dreamliner, 100 metres. Uh, we held a world record for flying a flight simulator around the world. It took 10 days to fly a light aircraft sim around the world in real time with celebrity pilots. So those are some of the more high-profile visual thing that, things that we've done over the years. But I think one of the things I'm most proud of is some of the more subtle things, like it's no longer unusual to see a disabled person on a UK airfield climb out of an airplane door, put their wheelchair together and wheel off towards the cafe, you know. A disabled pilot flying his airplane from a UK airfield is no longer a, an unusual thing to see, which is great. And tell me a little bit about how flying levels the playing field for disabled pilots. I think a lot of disabled people get different things from it. But, you know, it, it is really easy and true to talk about cliches, like seeing the world from a new perspective. But I think it's... Aviation has a unique set of, of sort of challenges which makes it so much fun. Obviously, you've got the, the great vistas and the views that you see. But you've got the responsibility of preparing the airplane, preparing your route, doing your flight safely, operating the airplane, navigating from A to B, flying it effectively, flying it smoothly, flying it efficiently. These are all the components that you need to do to effectively fly an airplane from A to B. And I think you bring all those things together, plus the, the challenge of maybe uh, unexpected bad weather or a system on the airplane that you need to resolve an issue with. Those sort of things that you train for as well make it a, a unique uh, sort of challenge of enjoying the moment, but also that background of training you need to fall back on. Uh, so all that tied together is is good from a practical perspective, but also just the fun of being, a, being around other people with a, a similar interest is also a great great bonus of the, uh, being part of it. And how do you think it benefits mental health? I think I've heard from many of our flyers, and maybe it's true for me, is that when you are flying, you're not thinking about the bad stuff that might be affecting you on the ground. Your disability, your pain, your challenges. You can often leave them behind. In the cockpit, you've got your own little positive world, somewhere where it's your happy place for so many people. So tell me a bit now about what Airability is working on next. What are the future projects? Well, Airability has got an increasing spectrum of output, if you like. So what we've always done is made aviation accessible. So we have the adapted aircraft, we have the hoist, we have the attitudes and technology to make it possible for so many people with different disabilities to fly. But now we're also looking to the future, trying to make sure that aviation is not only better at providing services to disabled people, so airlines and airports, for example, but also looking to the future of new types of flight, for example, eVTOL, you know, flying cars, flying taxis. That type of uh, travel is coming and coming really in the next few years. But the question we posed to the industry was, are you thinking about accessibility? You know, a flying car, potentially for a disabled person, is a brilliant mode of transport and could have more um, impact on them than an able-bodied person. So we challenged the industry to start to think about accessibility for people with reduced mobility, with learning disabilities, even mental health conditions on, on some of the, the spectrum disorders as well. And uh, we managed to stimulate competitions uh, within organisations and universities to think about that. So, yeah, these are some of the things we're thinking about for the future uh, to make sure that accessibility is built into the DNA of the future of flight as well. So, Mike, talking about diversity then, why do you think diversity is important and what do you think that we as a society can learn from embracing diversity? I guess there's two reasons. I think on the, on the most basic human level, we should make sure that we are inclusive of everybody around us. You know, I think 
I think we all know from our lives that where we do integrate with people with different backgrounds, different activities, different thought processes, different... What's the best way of putting it? Well, difference is good. And I think uh, by increasing diversity, everything gets better, both our, our personal lives and the way that we enjoy the world uh, and learn from others different ways of doing things. But also companies and service providers and those that effectively build the world around us should also reflect that diversity. So that enrichment occurs there as well. For example, one of the reasons we're trying to help the aviation community get better at employing disabled people is because of the simple fact if your employee workforce doesn't have a diverse community, people with different beliefs, uh, people with different ethnic backgrounds, disabilities, you will never be able to provide good services for those different individuals as well. So I think employee workforces should fully reflect the uh, communities they deliver to. And in the case of disability, globally, one fifth of the world's population has a disability. So most companies should employ one fifth disabled people to fully reflect that. So I firmly believe that that's the way we should be moving things.